Okay, starting over here. Um, I thought I had this thing figured out. All right. Get this thing right here. All right, well, I hope everyone figures it out. I started this, and it just kept saying, going live, going live, going live, and it didn't finish. Never started, so here we go. So now we're here. Okay, everybody seems to be finding where we are. All right, good. Got a lot of people showing up. Hello, everybody. I'm Robert Breaker, and today we're going to talk about denominations. This will be my Thursday live stream for today. Um, last week on Thursday, I did an interview with Scotty Clark, and that went well. and enjoyed that, and I thought about doing interviews, but, uh, well, I couldn't get anybody. But the week before that on Thursday, we did one on church history. Well, this will be kind of like part two to the church history one. A lot of people have asked me, Brother Breaker, why are there so many different denominations? So we're going to look at that today. We're going to go back a little bit into church history. Then we're going to find out what's the deal with all the different denominations. And a lot of people have asked me, Brother Breaker, what denomination are you? And I'm like, I don't really like to say what denomination I am. I'm really just a Bible believer. To me, that's the most important thing. So today we're going to look at denominations. Now, first of all, can you hear me? I need to know if I can be heard. Please let me know there in the chat if you can hear me. I had someone that I wanted to be on with me today, and they just couldn't make it. And so whenever I don't have a guest, I don't have to use the earphones. And that's great. Um, if I do have a guest, then I have to use that in order to use the microphone. So loud and clear. Great. Okay. So today we're going to look at denominations. I get this question all the time. Brother Breaker, why are there so many different Christian denominations? Uh, at one time, I had studied, and I read somewhere that there were 3,000 different denominations in Christianity. But somebody lately had sent me something that said, there's no, that's not right. There's 30,000 different denominations within Christianity. I was like, what? That's a lot, a lot more. I mean, what's that, a hundred times more? So I don't know how many denominations there are within Christianity today, but I know there should only be one. There should be only one group and that group is the body of Christ, those that are saved, and we should all be in one denomination. Now, why are there so many different denominations? Let's start today with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And what we're going to find today is kind of sad. There are a lot of different denominations because a lot of different people read the Bible in different ways and interpret it differently. And the Bible itself says that you need to be saved and that it's the Holy Spirit of God that guides and leads you into all truth. And what we're going to find today is that those that have the Holy Spirit all throughout the last 2,000 years of the church age, they've all interpreted it correctly because the Holy Spirit showed them, hey, the Apostle Paul, Paul's gospel, salvation through faith, not of works. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately today, there's uh, many different denominations. Part of it is that people start these denominations that aren't saved. Uh, other denominations, there are saved people in them, but they're following tradition rather than the Bible. So let's see what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 21. I hope you have your Bible with you. Please make sure you have a King James Bible. And uh, again, this is a live stream, but it's more like me teaching, okay? So I don't have time to read everything. I always enjoy going back later and watching and then reading what people comment. Um, but let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 21. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be, um, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Boy, if if everyone that claimed to be a Christian did that, there'd only be one denomination. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of divisions. Verse eleven: For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe that there are, there are contentions among you. And as you know, there are a lot of people within Christianity that are contentious. They are contentious people. What is a contention? It's, it's someone that's arguing with someone else. Uh, verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, which is Peter, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. 
Verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the, Christ, the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is them to perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Verse 21, And after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. So the Apostle Paul says we're all supposed to have the same mind. We're all supposed to get together, have no divisions among us. We're all supposed to be perfectly joined together in what we believe. And what we believe is the Word of God. And so what is it that Paul says that is supposed to be the basis of fellowship for all Christians? The gospel. We should all have the gospel. Of course, the gospel that Paul's talking about is the gospel of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So why then are there so many different divisions in so many different denominations and they all call themselves Christian? Why is that? Well, Paul tells us that according to his writings, we're supposed to be followers of Paul. And that'll tell you right there whether someone really is a Christian or not. I mean, they could be saved and not understand this, but if you are saved, you should understand this, that the Paul, the gospel of Paul is, a, is the gospel that God revealed to the Apostle Paul for us today. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul tells us that, how the gospel that he preached was not after man, but was from Jesus Christ. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show church history again, like we did uh, two weeks ago. But I'm also going to show all the different denominations. Now, I'm not going to give all... 30,000 or even 3,000. I might even just only give like 10 or 20. But I want you to see that throughout history, there's been the true church of the true believers in Christ. And they have had different names over time. But they all had something in common. They all got together on the gospel of Paul and followed Paul. If they did not follow Paul and Paul's gospel, then they were not a Christian denomination, although they called themselves Christians. They were following somebody else or something else. 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says this, Wherefore I beseech ye, be ye followers of me. Apostle Paul says we should be followers of him. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now people say, well, if you're a follower of Paul, then you're not a follower of Jesus. <laughs> Au contraire, mon ami. No, the only way to follow Jesus today is to follow Paul. Because Jesus revealed things to Paul for us today. So unless you come to Paul, you're missing the message that Jesus gave for us because he used Paul to channel his message to the world today. So you need to be a follower of Paul because that's the way to follow Jesus today. Philippians 3, 7 is another verse, and I've got several verses here, and then I'm going to go hog wild on the whiteboard today. I've got lots to draw up here. But Galatians chapter 3, and verse 17 is another place. So I've given you two verses where Paul says, be followers of me. Here's the third one. Paul says here in Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. And sample. So be followers of me. So a true believer is someone who follows the Apostle Paul and Paul's gospel. Now why? Well, Ro Romans 11.13. Romans 11.13, Paul tells us what his ministry is, and... Most people in the world today are this. It says in Romans eleven thirteen, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. That's what we are today. That's what the majority of the world is today, is Gentiles. Now, people say, well, if he's only to the Gentiles, then that means Jews can't get saved. No, God can save Jews. Romans 1, uh, 16, Paul says, uh, the gospel of Christ to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Jews get saved the same way we do today. Okay, there's no two different gospels. It's the one gospel of salvation today for both Jew and Gentile. Unfortunately, Israel as a nation has rejected their Messiah. So most Jews want nothing to do with Jesus. I've met lots of Jews in my life, and I always try to ask them, well, what do you think of Jesus? Oh, well, yeah, he was a Jew, but we don't accept him. And that's really sad. And then I knew one man who was a Jew that did get saved, and he was the happiest man. Oh, man, he was such a happy man. He just kept saying, I love my Jewish Jesus. 
And he was a Jew because he, man, he was excited about getting saved. So Romans chapter 15, Paul clearly tells us the difference between the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Paul. And that's what we need to see today is the very difference of the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the apostle Paul. Is there a difference? Some people today say, oh, you Robert Breaker, you're just so crazy. There's no difference. We're all under the same teachings and preachings today. And we go by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and all these other things. And you're like, uh, no, if you rightly divide the word of truth, if you read your Bible, you see why Paul is in the Bible. And Paul is there for a reason. Paul tells us in Romans 5, 15, 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision. So Jesus' job when he came was to tell Israel, hey, I'm here. And Jesus' ministry was about teaching about the kingdom that could have come had the Jews accepted their Messiah. But then Paul says, now look at the difference between me and Jesus. Verse 16, Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So the ministry of Paul was more to Gentiles. Now, we're reading through the book of Acts and studying the book of Acts, and I hope you're studying that with us verse by verse. Everywhere Paul went, he went to the Jew first. So even though he was the minister uh, or uh, apostle to the Gentiles, he always cared about his people, the Jews, and he always wanted to see them saved too. But this is Paul's ministry. So Paul's ministry is for us today. So we go back to Paul, and if we want to have the right denomination as a church, it should be a church that is Pauline in its doctrine, which means it's centered on Paul because they understand that Paul is the one that God revealed many things to for the church and that Paul is the one that went out of the world to try to win the Gentiles. And so we need to, to listen to and heed the message of Paul. Now, Acts chapter 20, Paul warns us about what's going to happen after he's gone. And in Acts chapter 20, look at what Paul says. Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. So instead of following, following Paul, they say, hey, follow me. That's where your new different, different dispensations come from. Or denominations, I said dispensation. Your different denominations come from it. Some guy comes in and starts his own little group and starts his own little church. And uh, we're going to look at this today. Many of the denominations were started with men. So that's an interesting thing. But Paul warns of that. And Paul says, look, watch out. Don't let some man lead you astray and become a disciple of a man. Be a disciple of the scriptures and follow what God revealed to Paul. You say, well, you're following a man, you're following Paul. Yeah, well, the Bible says to. <laughs> if the Bible says follow uh, John Doe, uh, okay, where's John Doe? I'll go. You see, we do what the Bible says, amen? Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul warns us again. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this is an interesting verse. Paul warns us about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. 2 Corinthians 11 13 through 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. There are some people out there that are false apostles, and they say, but we're of Jesus. And Paul says, watch out for that. Verse 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So the devil has false apostles, and the devil has false ministers. So that means that the devil has his denominations. You see, the devil saw what Jesus did when he died on the cross, and he said, uh-oh, Jesus is, is he's gonna, he did that to save people, and, and wow, now, and now they're going out and preaching, and a lot of these people are accepting this, and they're starting churches, and the devil said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to imitate everything that God does. And so the devil started his own churches. And he took the name Christian and he said, we're Christian too. And what do they have? They have false doctrine. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, the Apostle John talks about in his day, and I believe that Revelation was written about 90 to 95 AD. 
So this is way after Paul would have died. And it says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. So way out here, 90 something AD, we see a false denomination already formed. They had claiming that they were apostles, but they were lying. They were teaching a doctrine that wasn't the right doctrine. They were saying, we are something that we're not. Follow us. Who would that be? The people Paul warned us of. Those going around trying to um, deceive people. And those going around trying to say, hey, be my disciple. Come after me. So we have two lines of Christianity. The true line of Christianity, those that follow Paul throughout history. And then we have the false line. Those that have turned against Paul. So we have the Pauline denomination, and then we have every other denomination. Now, last time, as we looked at this, I showed you that about 325 A.D., somewhere around this time, we had a false church being set up. And that false church took the name of Catholicism. They took the name Catholic. And that would be the Roman Catholic Church. And we saw how that started in about 325 A.D. So about 325 years after Jesus, we see this gigantic, gigantic denomination being formed. And it says, hey, we're Christian. But do they follow Paul? No. That church says, why well, we follow Peter. So they say their foundation is Peter. They took a different man. Now, there's nothing wrong with Peter. But Peter didn't say, be you followers of me. Peter didn't say, the gospel that I preach, you follow. Peter didn't say, I'm your apostle. So you've got this false line of Christianity. You've got the true line, the Pauline, and let me, I'll just go ahead and write that up here, the Pauline. People ask me, are you Pauline, rubber breaker? You bet I am. That's where we get our doctrine from. We're to have Pauline doctrine because the right line of the true church is the church that is Pauline in their doctrine following Paul. But then we have the anti-Pauline church, and that would be this church. Because the Roman Catholic Church, they don't preach what Paul preaches. Paul's gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And Paul's gospel is that you're saved by grace through faith and not of works. So we're saved by faith. This gospel of this church is faith plus works. And it says you follow us and you do what we say. Don't follow Paul. Follow the Pope. And it's by works as well as faith that you just might can get to heaven. Why do you say you just might can get to heaven? Because if you do follow the Catholic Church... They don't tell you how to get to heaven. They tell you, if you'll do everything we say, then you go to purgatory and burn. <laughs> that doesn't sound like anything good. Did Paul preach that? Why, no. Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Paul taught, go to heaven when you die, instantaneously, not go burn in purgatory. So this is a different church, a different line, and a different denomination. And this denomination does not appear to be the correct denomination of Christianity because it leaves Paul out. It really substitutes Peter instead of Paul. So let's go back to our scriptures and let's look at some things that Paul says. 2 Thessalonians 3.6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 6, Paul says this. The people say, oh, you're so against the Catholic Church. No, I'm against the false doctrine of the church. There are many people I know that are Catholic that are just sweet, nice people. I love them. But I want them to get saved, and I want them to get the right gospel. Because in that church, they're not preaching the Paul gospel. They're preaching... Uh, get baptized as a baby, go to confession, go to the mass, do all these things, get confirmed, do all this. And you say, okay, I did it. Okay, now you're going to burn in purgatory. All that for that? That's not very good. Um, Paul says you get saved by the gospel, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, promise you go to heaven when you die. Yeah, that, that sounds a lot better. And that's the true preaching of the scriptures. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. So Paul says if someone's not following the tradition of Paul, the doctrine of Paul, then they're disorderly. You can't follow them. So that's a warning from Paul. Now there's another warning, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And I, man, I can't wait. There's so much to get into in this. This is going to be a lot of fun. I just have to give all this, you know, for, from the beginning because I want to give as much scripture as I can so we can all see that I'm not making this up. You know, there's the true line of true Christianity. Then there's these other denominations, and they're false. 
because they leave out the most important thing. See, the most important thing, the foundation of Christianity, is the blood atonement of Christ. And we're saved and forgiven of our sins, justified by faith in that blood. That was Paul's message. But other denominations, they don't believe that. So you've got to go back to the one that has the foundation of the blood atonement of Christ. And that would be Paul. Romans 16, 17 and 18. 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So Paul says, if there's a different denomination, and they're not following Paul, then he says, mark them and, and, and avoid them. Don't accept their doctrine. Always stick to the doctrine of the Bible. People say, oh, Brother Breaker, Catholics are saved too, and they're in the body of Christ. Really? Do you know what Catholics say? All throughout this history of this line of the Catholic Church, they have forbidden people from reading the Bible. When the King James Bible came out, the Pope says, oh, that's that's the Protestant Pope, the King James Bible. Why? They go around telling everybody to read the Bible. What a horrible thing. Anybody that's Catholic or knows a Catholic will tell you, they are told and taught there's no salvation outside of Holy Mother Church. You go to a Catholic and you say, can I show you what the Bible says? They say, I'm, I'm not allowed to read that. The priest says, I can't read the Bible. I have to go by what that church says. He said, what do you mean? You're supposed to read the Bible. Can I show you some verses? No, the, the, the priest says, I can't understand it. Only he can interpret it. Watch out for any denomination that tells you not to read the Bible. The Bible is God's word. And Paul tells us, no, you stick with the doctrine of this and you mark them and you get away from them if they don't allow you to look at what the Bible itself says. So following Paul, we see the true church. And following Paul, we see a false church. And the false church persecuted the true church. Who were the false ones? Those with another gospel. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4. Look at what it says here in Galatians 2, 4. In Paul's day, he saw people that were deviating from and going away from what God revealed to him. And in Galatians 2 and verse 4, he says, and, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, they may, might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul says there were some people that came in in his day and tried to get in and say, don't follow Paul. Don't believe his doctrine. Don't listen to his gospel. There's another way. Follow us in the other way. And Paul says, no, we do not give them the time of day. That's a false denomination with a false gospel. And they're false brethren. They're not truly saved. So you've got to watch out for that. So throughout history, we clearly see, and we looked at this a little bit last time, that throughout history there have always existed believers that believed in the gospel of Paul and that you're saved by faith, not by works. And they've had many different names throughout history, like Paulicians, like Novatians, like Donatists, names like Catharii. You can go and study church history and find these people that existed. And what's interesting, you find these people and they're going around saying they're Christians, but they're being persecuted by the Catholic Church, which says it's Christian. They're fighting each other. And these are dying left and right because the Catholic Church is burning them at the stake and killing them in religious wars. For what? Their only crime was, no, it's not by works. No, it's not the Pope that saves us. It's the Bible, and it's Paul, and it's his gospel. Kill them! Kill them, that church says. And that church has the blood of many saints on its hands because it's killed many of these people who say, no, we will not baptize our babies because that's not in the Bible. And you have the Waldenses. And you have the Albigenses. Oops, Albigenses. And you have all these different throughout history names. Uh, there was some that called themselves the Lollards. And you have the, they were, they were called Anabaptists by the Catholic Church because they would not baptize their babies. 
And the Catholic Church says, well, you're Anna. You're against. You're against water baptism, you bunch of heretics. Well, show me in the Bible where anyone baptizes a baby. You can't. That was a tradition that this came up with. They actually got it from paganism, not from the Bible. And so you've got all these. And eventually they dropped the name Anna, and they embraced the name. And they said, you know what we'll call ourselves? We'll call ourselves Baptists. Because what we believe in is baptizing someone when they're an adult, like they did in the book of Acts, not when they're a baby. And so they took the name Baptist. So this, these are where different names throughout the last 2,000 years of the church age, these were different names of different believers. And then you had the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, they had what they called the Spanish Inquisition, which is really sad. And under the Spanish Inquisition, they killed a lot of people. So this church, the Catholic Church, was a state-run church. And so it joined with the state, and it was a state-run church. So you, you got to watch out for that. I mean, the Bible calls it this present evil world. You don't, as a Christian, shack up with the world and come together. And so many atrocities were done by this church over the last 2,000 years as they murdered and cold blood people and killed people, and they did just, just horrible things. And I've showed you before this book called The Trail of Blood. And if you get a chance, find that. It's, it's by J.M. Carroll. And it's very simple and to the point, and it talks about what we just looked at today and how there's existed always true Bible-believing Christians and then how this church has always persecuted them. So many Christians have been murdered. And so that this is one reason why I've come across people lately, and, and I get emails from people saying, Robert Breaker, Christianity is just an awful religion. So many people killed in Christianity. I'll never be a Christian because all they do is kill each other. Well, they don't understand. That's what they did here. But there's always existed true Christians that didn't believe in going along and killing people. They were the true line that came from Paul. Matter of fact, the first 100, 200 years after Jesus, they were called Paulicians because they followed Paul. So there's always been the true line of the true church. And then there's always been a false line. And Paul said and warned in his day, now watch out. Watch out because there will be people that come in. Let me show you some more verses on that. Paul warns us not to be deceived. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. He says, Rooted and built up in him, established in faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, verse 8, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. This church down here is full of tradition. And much of that church, it's all about tradition rather than the Bible. You go to a Catholic church and you say, hey, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you do this? I don't see it in the Bible. Why do you do that? And they say, because we've done that for the last 2,000 years. And that's our tradition. And you say, oh, well, okay. So your church is really a tradition. It's not, it's not doing something because it's in the Bible. It's because it's a tradition. Well, you got to watch out for that because the Bible warns about tradition. In Mark 7, 13, it says tradition makes the word of God an unaffected. If tradition says one thing and the Bible says something else, what should we follow? The Bible, always. Because oftentimes this church has traditions that are anti-biblical. Let me give you a quick example. Jesus said, call no man on earth, on earth your father. And the context was in a religious setting. Well, the Roman Catholic Church is full of priests and they say, call me father. What's that all about? Uh, Jesus said, uh, no vain repetition as the heathen do. When you pray, don't pray with vain repetition and saying the same thing over and over and again. You go to the Catholic Church, they give you a little bead and say, now, pray this same prayer over and over and over and over and over and over again with the beads. Well, that would be a vain repetition. Why Jesus said not to do that. Why are you? So there's many things inside this church that are against Scripture, and yet this church does it anyway because they call it tradition. And as you study that church, you find much of that tradition comes from paganism and not from the Bible. Much of, of paganism entered into that church. Now, let's go to the book of Jude. Jude uh, tells us something here very important. Jude, verse 3 and 4. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We should contend for the faith. The faith is faith in the blood. The gospel is how that Christ died. We should always contend with anyone else, whoever they are, if they claim to be a Christian, on, on the fact that we're saved by faith in the blood. We're not saved by works. 
And then verse 4, for there are certain men. Why, why do we contend for the faith? Why do we stand on the true faith, the true gospel? Verse 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Lasciviousness. Remember I told you in our church history study about how the Catholic Church would literally sell indulgences in the 1500s and the 1400s. It was literally a license, and you would go to the Catholic priest and say, you know, I, I, I want to do this sin, but I know it's a bad sin, and I don't want to go to hell. Um, something I can do, and the priest says, yeah, if you pay so much money, I'll write you a piece of paper that says, God allows, because you have paid for this, this certain sin be done on such and such a time and such and such a day. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. That's sick. That's disgusting, selling a license to sin. But because they were set up with the state, they thought, well, we can do that. We can do whatever we want. We've got the whole backing of the state to kill people that are against us. So we'll do whatever. And they have. And that church, oh, boy, that church has done a lot of bad over the years. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we read this. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, Paul tells us this. 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16. Meditate upon these things. He's talking to Timothy, and these things would be a reference to the Bible. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So the doctrine that God gave us to Paul through the Bible, that's what we stick with is the doctrine of the Bible. We don't allow ourselves to get into some religious denominational system that follows tradition rather than scriptures. Okay? Can everybody hear me okay? All right. I guess so. All right. Let's hope so. If you can hear me, say hello. I hear you. Okay. All right. So continuing on here, according to the scripture, it's all about taking heed to the doctrine. All right. Where does doctrine come from? the Bible. This is where we go. Any Christian has this book. Anyone that claims to be a Christian should should know that this is where all of our beliefs come from. And we're supposed to always go to the Bible because this is the authority in all matters of faith and practice. Our authority isn't a man. Our authority isn't anything but what God said in the Bible. And that's what we should go by. And let me just show you a couple verses on that real quick. Second Peter Chapter 1. So I am a Bible-believing Christian. And I understand that in order to be a Christian, I have to follow the Bible. I cannot follow a denomination set up by some man. I don't care how old it is. A thousand, two thousand years old. I'm not going to follow tradition. I'm not going to follow men. I want to make sure that what they say lines up with the Bible. And if it doesn't, then I'm looking at that as those must be the guys that came in and tried to pull people away and make their own disciples. And Paul warned me of that. And in 2 Peter 1.19, the Bible says this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rising in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the context is the Scriptures. And it says we have a more sure word of prophecy. The Bible is our more sure word of prophecy. We go by what the Bible says, not by, by what some man says. Oftentimes what a man will say is the opposite of what the Bible says. So that's why we go to the scriptures. And that's why we, as Christians, look at the Bible as our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Why? Why are you so dogmatic about the Bible? Well, because we read in the Bible that this is the engrafted word which is able to save our soul. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 17. And so you've got to hear what the Bible says and understand it and believe, and that's when you get saved. So I'm saved not by a church. A church doesn't save me. I'm saved when I read the Bible because the Bible gives me the way of salvation. 2 Timothy 3.14 but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child you ha thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. According to that, we are saved 
by faith. I guess it won't get in there. And <laughs> Okay, I couldn't get it to zoom in. But it says that the scriptures make us wise unto salvation through faith. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly first, and all good works. So my faith is in what God says in the scriptures. And the Bible itself says I can only be saved by what it says here. And it says I'm saved by faith. So I don't care how big a denomination is, how old a denomination is. If that denomination is telling me don't read the Bible, follow us. Do what we say. Listen to what we say. We say you got to do this to get to heaven. Listen to us. Listen to this man who's the head of us in Rome. I'm going to say, no, fully on you. I want to know what the Bible says. So I'm not going to follow a denomination that claims to be of God. I'm going to follow the scriptures. And I'm going to look to the Bible to see if that denomination does line up with the Bible. So all throughout history, we've had the true line of believers those that were true believers in Christ, the top line here, and I guess out here is going to be the rapture, so I'll just put it right there. We're just dealing with the church age today, not the tribulation or anything else. So as we look at the history of Christianity and the history of the church, we clearly see people that did follow what Paul said and were preaching the true gospel of salvation. Now, they had other names. Now, I don't know where to put up here. Some people wanted me to put up the Amish. And at one time, the Amish were pretty good preachers and Quakers. But I really see that the Amish and Quakers have, have really gone against the gospel of Paul now. If you know anyone that's Amish or if you know anyone that's a Quaker today, they're often telling you that it's by works. So they have really gone away. So I really don't want to put them up there. Um, I don't even, you know, I mentioned them. Okay, last time someone said, you didn't mention the Quakers. You didn't mention the Amish. Uh, you didn't mention, mention the Mennonites. And there are some good Mennonites that, that actually the Mennonites came from the Baptist, they say, uh, in a Baptist. Uh, but I've met some Mennonites that believe faith and works. I've met other Mennonites that believe correctly. So it, it's really hard to lump everyone in a basket and say, oh, you're one of those. Well, you believe this. There's a lot of changing going on and a lot of different dispensations. They'll take a name, but sometimes within that dispensation, they'll change their 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 beliefs, unfortunately. Well, here we have the Baptist, and then later we had the Civil War in America. And in America, they the Baptist they became Southern Baptist and Northern Baptist. And today we still have sort of Southern Baptist. You, you'll never hear of a Northern Baptist; they don't exist anymore. The Northern Baptist changed into uh, American Baptist, Missionary Baptist. And there's a American Baptist. And uh, so the Northern Baptists, they just kind of disbanded and changed their name. Now there's many different kinds of Baptists, unfortunately. And uh, there's free will Baptists, which are Calvinists. Uh, there's all these different kinds. And a lot of these Southern Baptists, for sure, are going into apostasy. But I put them up here because at one time they were pretty doctrinally sound. As a matter of fact, in, uh, in America, uh, most of the people in America were either Baptist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, or Church of England. For most of the founding of America, all the way out into the 18, almost 1900s. And that reminds me, too, of these. Let me put these up here, okay? I'm going to have to erase the Spanish Inquisition here to have room. There are also Protestants. And we looked at that last time, but I forgot to mention, really, who the Protestants were. In about the 1500s with Martin Luther, and people ask me, is Brother Breaker, is Martin Luther saved? Yes, I think Martin Luther was saved because he got a hold of Paul's message. But I don't think he was right on all his doc doctrine. I want to make sure I threw that out there. He died as a Catholic. Some people say had he lived a few more years, he would have gotten out of the Catholic Church altogether. He was deceived. He was thinking that this really was the true church. It just had a lot of lost people in it. But I do believe that Martin Luther got the truth and he set off this movement of, hey, the Catholic Church is full of, of errors and mistakes and half-truths and lies and a lot of sin in it. And so you had these people called Protestants. Why were they called Protestants? Because they were protesting the grave injustices within the Catholic Church. 
And out of that came these denominations, the Lutherans, um, Anglicans. Here's an Anglican. You have the, the Church of England. Uh, you have, you know, start with Henry. You have the Tyrians. And they got closer to the true line. And a lot of these, they did preach the gospel. Thank God. But today, whew, you go to your typical Presbyterian or Episcopalian church, you won't hear them, hear them preach the message of salvation by faith in the blood of Jesus. They just don't. They've, they've gone into apostasy. Uh, we got Puritans. Uh, Methodists. Methodists. Calvinists. They, they for sure. So this is where your Protestants came from. And a lot of people say, well, Protestants, were they even saved? A lot of Protestants, when they got out of the Catholic Church, they got a hold of the message of salvation by faith alone. And yeah, they did get saved. And they started themselves in new denominations. So they started their own denominations. And usually it started with a man. Calvin was started by John Calvin. A Methodist, was that uh, Wesley? Uh, Puritans, I don't remember who that was. Episcopalians, uh, I don't remember, but Presbyterians, I think that was John Knox that started that. Church of England was because uh, King Henry said, I, I'm done with the Catholic Church. They won't let me divorce my wife. So he, he, he left England from the Catholic Church and started a state-run religion, the Church of England, which I think now is still called Anglicans, uh, Martin Luther. So this is where you're getting all these different names from all these different denominations. This is where they're coming from. But if you study church history, you find there always were true believers that never deviated from it. They stuck with it. And they came all the way out here. Now, today, we're starting to see a lot of apostasy. And so I think the apostasy is really, really starting now. I really, you know what, I'm backing up a little bit. Southern Baptists today are learning to become a really apostate. So uh, somewhere around here, we'll do it that way. This is where the apostasy began. The apostasy is in the last days, people falling away from the truth. In the last couple hundred years, people began to fall away from the truth of the scriptures. There was great revival in the 1500s, and then we had the Reformation and, and the Renaissance and all these things, because people were able to start reading their Bibles. You see, Gutenberg and the Gutenberg Bible. When Gutenberg was able to start producing um, books... Why people said, you know what? We never knew how to read, but man, books are being printed left and right. We might as well learn how to read it. So they started reading. They started reading their Bible, and they said, "Wow, the Catholic Church is really, really off, and it doesn't agree with the Scriptures." So more and more people began to understand salvation, and they got saved to the preaching of Paul. So this is where some of your denominations come from, and I wanted to throw that up there and show you the names of different denominations. Okay, now in the last. 150, 200 years, there were five gigantic cults that came around in this in this world. And let me show you what it says. 1 Timothy 4.1. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4.1 at the words of Paul. A prophecy from Paul of what would happen in the last days. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the later times... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In the last times, people would depart from the faith. And demons, devils, would raise them up to start their own denomination. That's not teaching Bible, rather it's teaching doctrine of devils. Now, I think the five main religious cults, and I was hoping to put them up here, but I just don't have room, so I'll have to put it over here. Let me go ahead and write up what these five main religious cults are. The five main cults in the last days. And what's funny is these cults didn't come on the scene until the 1800s. And each one of them says that they are the only denomination that has the truth. And you've got you've to scratch your head and go, wait a minute. So God didn't give anyone the truth for 1,800 years, and now because of you, we finally got it? So for those 1,800 years, nobody had the truth? 
That no, that doesn't that's not logical. But these say we are the right church. The first one is the the Church of the Latter day Saints, the Mormons. The Mormons started with Joseph Smith in about 1830. And Joseph Smith rose up and said, you know what? All these different denominations, well, they're all wrong. I'm right. And God appeared to me, an angel, and he told me that they're all wrong and that only I'm going to have the true gospel. And he said, he literally said, an angel gave me a, a gospel to preach in the last days. Now, what does Paul say about that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Galatians chapter 1. Paul says these words in Galatians 1. This is, this is incredible. Galatians chapter 1, verse, seven, verse 8. Galatians 1, 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached, let him be accursed. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. <laughs> and then this guy says... You all need to worship me because God sent an angel to tell me that you all are apostasy and you're all lost with a false gospel and only I have the right gospel. And I look at my Bible and I look at him and I look at my Bible and I go, <laughs> because I can't follow what you just said because it's against the Bible. And this is one of the biggest cults in the world today. And it started in the 1800s. And the Bible warns us in the last days there'll be doctrines of devils. You know, this guy was married 24 something, something like 24 women at one time. That's called adultery. The Bible is not a license to sin. I mean, that just sounds horrible. So here's one of the big cults that started in the 1800s. The other one would be the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists uh, is, a, is a denomination that started around 1860-something. And it started with Helen G. White and a Mr. Miller in Battle Creek, Michigan, when they met together for Bible studies in an insane asylum. Yeah, you, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, I've literally been there, and I looked at the building, and it was an insane asylum. And that's the building they chose to meet in to start this denomination. They call themselves the Seventh-day Adventists. And Seventh-day Adventism, if you know what it is today, it, it mixes law with grace. So it's faith and works. And it started by setting a date. And this, this guy, Mr. Miller, why he set a date, the, the end of the world will be in 1800 and such and such. And it didn't come. He was a false date setter. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the next one you have in about 1880 is Christian Science. And, oh, man, I don't know if you've ever read the book of the Christian Science lady. But, man, she must have had a devil. She says that Jesus Christ is not God. That, that's what devils do. They deny the deity of Christ. And I've tried reading her book, and I've gone through some of it, but and I, she lost me. When, I, when she said Jesus isn't God in the flesh, I said, that's it. I'm done with that lady. And her name was Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddy. And why would she have such a long name? Well, she divorced a bunch of husbands and married again. But Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddy, in about 1880, she started a denomination called Christian Science. And again, all these say, we're the right religion. We're the right denomination. Come to us. And you look at it and go, yeah, but you haven't been around but, but less than 200 years. <laughs> Why would I go to you? When Paul says, watch out the last days, there will be uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So devils are going to come along and start their own religions. And basically, uh, then you have what's called the JWs or the Jehovah Witnesses. And the Jehovah Witnesses, um, I call them Jehovah Windbags. I'm sorry if that offends you. Actually, I'm not sorry if that offends you. Because Jehovah Witnesses are very, very sad. Their doctrine does not teach salvation by faith. In fact, they deny that Jesus Christ is even God. And they're very anti-blood of Christ and salvation through faith. They don't believe in going to heaven. They believe when you die, you just cease to exist. And they believe that the reason they teach is to get ready for the kingdom because they don't even believe there's a rapture or anything like that. And this was started by Charles Taze Russell. And Charles Taze Russell was a very wicked man. You can go to Allegheny or wherever the place was in, in Pennsylvania where he was buried, and there's a pyramid over his grave. And he died on Halloween night. Some people think he was an Illuminati sacrifice. He appears to have been some sort of an Illuminati man. So you've got Illuminati starting these religions. 
And I've got I've got a YouTube video on why I'm not a Jehovah Witness. If you want to know more about that, check that out. I've got a YouTube video on why I'm not a Mormon. Um, I don't have one on why I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist or Christian Science. Maybe someday. It's just a lot of work goes into that. Then you have, in the 1900s, a group called the Pentes. The Pen Watch out for Pentes. You know, Pentagram, that sounds evil. The Pentecostals. And the Pentecostals started around 1906 with a Miss McAllister and a William T. Seymour. And you look at these denominations today, and these denominations stand up and they say, why, well, we're the right denomination, we're the right one. And you look at it and you go, yeah, but you're not that old. <laughs> you know, I, my denomination, I, I can tie it going back all the way to the Apostle Paul. Your denomination was founded 100 years ago? So, you mean for 1,900 years people had the false gospel? False denomination? Uh, no. No, there's something wrong with what you're telling me. Paul told me to watch out for you because the last days the devil's going to start um, his churches. So these are the, the five biggest denominations in the world today. Now, there still exist Episcopalians, Lutherans, Anglicans, and things like that. But I don't know if I told you this, but many of these are already starting to go back to the Catholic Church. So even though they, they left at one time, they're starting to go right back in. But up here, we have the true line of true believers that gave their life for Christ. That's why this book is called The Trail of Blood, because it shows how these people up here were martyrs for what they believed in. And what do they believe in? Well, they always stuck with what Paul said. Now, I have a video, you can, or a book, called Why I'm a Baptist by Robert Breaker. I wrote this. I People ask me, what are you, Robert Breaker? Well, I, I'm an ordained independent Baptist, and I thought what I'd do is I'd talk to you a little bit about that. I've also wrote another book called Why I'm More Than Just a Fundamentalist, and I want to explain what fundamentalism is and, and, and Baptist, why Baptist, and, and it's hard for me to say Baptist because Baptists today are so apostate. Even Baptists are going into apostasy. And that's why I don't really like to tell people what denomination I am, because I want to say I'm just a Bible believer. Because, like my old pastor said, if Baptists say one thing and the Bible says another, he said, you chunk those Baptists and you follow that scripture. <laughs> and I was like, hey, man, you follow the Bible rather than a denomination. So I don't like to call myself some sort of a denominationalist. But I look at all the different denominations that exist, and they're not close to the scriptures. The Mormons, they've got a false gospel from the beginning. And they go against Paul. The Seventh-day Adventists, why well, they don't understand that we're no longer under the law. The Bible says in Romans 10, 4, that Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. The Christian science, well, what does the Bible say about science? Well, it says, watch out for science, falsely so-called. Jehovah Witnesses, what, what, watch out for them. They don't even believe in hell. What about the Pentecostals? Well, the Pentecostals say, we're in the last days, and we're speaking in tongues. And you go to your Bible, and it's like, no, tongues are for a sign for the Jews. The Jews are the ones that are supposed to have tongues. And they say, no, no, we're, well, why, we've got the Holy Spirit being poured out on us. Well, Joel, the book of Joel says the Holy Spirit's poured out. Yeah, okay, I went over to Joel, and it says that's going to happen to Jews. And guess what? When I get saved, Paul says, I have the Holy Spirit. So why am I going around asking God to pour the Holy Spirit out on me if I've already got it when I got saved? <laughs> So I look at all these as cults. That's why I call them cults. They are false denominations with false teaching. Now, there might be some people saved in the Pentecostals, but usually they get out like I did. I was in the Pentecostals for four years, and I wasn't saved. I never heard the gospel one time. I got saved when I got out of that, and I thank God for that. I don't know if there's people saved in the Seventh-day Adventist. It may be possible, but you would think the Holy Spirit would get them out of that. I'm pretty sure there's no saved Mormons, but they, you know, there might... But I had a blessing a lady called the other day and said she watched my video in Spanish on why I'm not a Mormon. She said she got saved and she got out of that. So these are not preaching Paul and Paul's gospel. Uh, today, these don't seem to be either. Maybe Calvinists, but they're so confused they don't know their hat from their, from their shoe. Um, the Methodists today, many Methodist churches uh, believe in faith and works. They believe you have to keep it to stay saved. So you got to do works to keep your salvation or you can lose it. Uh, I don't think there's any more Puritans. I don't think they exist anymore. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, one of my heroes, was a Puritan. And many Puritans believed in the gospel. And at one time were saved. Many Methodists at one time were saved when it first started. Episcopalians, yeah. A lot of Episcopalians pre preached the gospel. But they were more of a ritualistic church. A lot of ritualism going on in that church. 
uh, Presbyterians. Many Presbyterians were Calvinists, but yeah, there were some saved Presbyterians in the 1800s, but they really went downhill fast in their colleges and things like that in the 1900s. And many Presbyterian churches today don't ever preach the gospel. The Church of England, it's, it's very hard to find the gospel in the Church of England, maybe in the low church. The high church, oh, complete apostasy. Anglicans as well. The Anglican church might as just might as well just call itself Roman Catholic because they believe in many of the same things that Catholicism does. Uh, Lutherans today. Lutherans today have signed an accord with the Pope, and they say, yeah, we're, we're Catholic again. So many of these denominations that at one time might have preached the gospel correctly, they've gone back into apostasy. So you go through all these people and you look at them, they were dying for Jesus, giving their, their life for what they believed in. You don't see these people dying for what they believe in. You see these people. So we come up here to Baptist. Now, at one time, the Baptist denomination was the closest to the Bible. Of all the different denominations, the Baptists were the one that said, we follow the Bible, and what the Bible says, that's what we go by. And so at one time, the Baptists were the closest to the Scriptures. It can't be denied. I mean, you, you, you were a Baptist because you wanted to be a part of the denomination that believed the Bible and had your doctrine from the Scriptures. So I wrote this book, Why I'm a Baptist, years ago. Um, you can find this on Amazon. I'll, I have on my website, thecloudchurch.org, and my old website, rrb3.com, uh, where all the title of my books are, but for some reason, the company sold to the big conglomeration, Amazon or something, and now the links don't work to go to buy. So if you want to buy one of my books, you have to actually look at the title and then go to amazon.com and type in the title and buy it that way. But you don't have to buy my books. They're free to read online rrb3.com is my old website, and each one of my books is on there for free to read if you want. So if you want to read why I'm a Baptist. Now, I'm almost ashamed to call myself a Baptist because so many Baptists nowadays have, have gone away from the Bible. But uh, there's still some good ones, still some. And this goes and shows you how they were the closest to the belief of the Bible and how they stuck with and tarried with the stuff. So when I was growing up, most people wanted to be Baptist because they're looking at all the different denominations out there and they're like, well, the one that, that says go to the scriptures and the one that has its doctrine the closest to the Bible was the Baptist. And it's funny, even to this day, when you deal with somebody, especially older people, you ask them, you know, what, what church are you? I'm this church, I'm that. But I grew up Baptist. They always like to say that. The Baptists were everywhere at one time. And the Baptists were those that did have at one time their doctrine closest to the scriptures. Well, then they became Southern Baptist, and now we have Independent Baptist. Now, in order to understand why Independent Baptists, I'm going to have to explain a little bit about fundamentalists and fundamentalism. Fundamentalism. Maybe you've heard someone say, I'm a fundamentalist. I believe in the fundamentals of the faith. Fundamentalist, fundamentalist. Or maybe you've heard someone say, I'm an independent fundamental Baptist, and they, and they insert the word fundamental. Well, I wrote a book on why I am more than just a fundamentalist. At one time, being a fundamentalist was a good thing. But now, even the fundamentalists have gone into apostasy. <laughs> and so, and, and this is my book about it. Again, you can read that for free on our rb3.com. And fundamentalism was, uh, is, well, let me back up here a little bit. In the 1700s, there's what's called German rationalism. And in the 1700s, these Germans came along. And in the 1700s, these Germans just started reading the Bible and going, nah, we don't believe it. So German rationalism, the Germans started writing books left and right saying, we don't believe. We don't believe Jesus did miracles. We don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Now, we, we're going to try to rationalize the Bible and take it all without the miracles, because we don't believe in miracles. So German rationalism was the beginning of the apostasy, because the Germans said, you know, we don't believe all that stuff in the Bible. We just can't believe it. And so German rationalism came in, and so the true Christians, they said, okay, we see these people going into apostasy, so we're going to have to go the other way. So they started what they called fundamentalism. They said, let's take, get together on the fundamentals of the faith, and let's stand for that, and let's not let these people tell us that, that the Bible's not true. And so a lot of people came along and, and you know, when America was founded, Harvard was a divinity, a divinity school. A lot of people don't know that. Yale was a divinity school. 
Uh, Princeton was a theological school, Princeton University, Presbyterian. And so a lot of these schools in America, uh, colleges now that are big, huge, wicked, progressive colleges, they used to be at one time colleges to train men to be preachers. And they were teaching them, go preach the gospel, faith. So in the 1800s, people began to accept German rationalism. And in the 1800s, a lot of Bible schools started to go, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe the Bible isn't true here. Maybe it's not true there. Maybe that's not true. Maybe, and a lot of people began to become skeptics. Where have I heard that before? Scoffers. And, you know, in the last days, people will be scoffers. Well, they begin to scoffer. And you had all this scholarship. And, and the scholars would say, well, we're so smart because we sit in the back rooms of, of colleges and, and we just sit around and read manuscripts all the time. Why we think, we think the Bible is an error. And we think no one's ever had the Bible. Why? We think that in 1881, Westcott and Hort finally gave us a true Bible. And you look at Westcott and Hort, man, those guys were horrible. So they're undermining the King James Bible. They're undermining the miracles in the scripture. They're undermining what all these people have believed and given their lives for believing in. And people begin to head toward um, apostasy. So in order to over for correct for that, many of these people, many of which were Baptists, some which were good Presbyterians or good Episcopalians or, or good people like that, they began to um, say, you know what we need to do? We need to, we need to get Christians together and we need to be fundamentalists. Now here's a name you might know, R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey was a famous preacher. R.A. Torrey wrote a book called The Fundamentals in 1910. And so fundamentalism, a lot of people say, started around 19, did I say 1910? 190. Yeah, 1910. But really before that, late 1800s, people started saying it's about the fundamentals of the faith. We need to stick with the fundamentals. Don't let the rationalists, the German rationalists, talk your faith out of the Bible and out of the belief of what the Bible says. So this guy, R.A. Torrey, comes along. And you might know who he is. And R.A. Torrey was pretty good. He, he still was a pretty good Christian. But uh, R.A. Torrey started this, and he says, we need, to, we need to unite true Christians, not the false ones that go to schools and learn how to be skeptics. And we need to stick together on the fundamentals. And he said, there's five fundamentals that we as Christians need to defend. The biblical inspiration of the scriptures, the virgin birth, the, blood sac the, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, um, that Jesus did do miracles, and then the blood atonement for sins, that the blood of Christ is the atonement for the sins of the world. So these are the uh, fundamentals of the faith, and many true Christians stood up and said, we've got to hold on to, and we've got to accept the fundamentals. Well, every time God does something, the devil always imitates it. It's horrible. And so the devil says, well, I can't have that. I'm trying to get them to all be a skeptics and not believe the Bible. So you know what? I'm going to come in. I'm going to take the same name. I'm going to set up the, the National Council of Churches. It was actually started as the FCC, the Federal, the Federal Council of Churches. So the FCC came along in 1908. Later, it called itself the National Council of Servant Ch uh, Churches in about 1950. And they called themselves fundamentalists. So you had true fundamentalists, Bible believers, that were saying, we're, we're stick with the Bible. But then you had this false church down here saying, well, we're fundamentalists too. But their fundamentals was a different list of fundamentals. <laughs> And that's what this book is about, why I'm more than just a fundamentalist. Because according to them, they whittled the fundamentals down to something that even a Catholic could believe. And so you could, you could believe the fundamentals and still be lost. They took out that one, of course. They didn't want to say that it's only by that. And so what happens? Well, this is an ecumenical movement. This is what's known as today, the ecumenical movement. And the National Council of Churches, this ecumenical movement, was formed, and it says, let's unite all these different denominations. Let's all come together and unite together in one big happy church where we all just believe the same thing. But here's the thing. You can't believe what these people believe. You have to believe what they believe. That the Bible has errors, there's mistakes, there weren't really miracles. You know, when the Bible said Jesus did this, he may or may not. No, the blood doesn't really save you. You see, you've got you've got to do these works to be saved. At this time, the Catholic Church had taken over the North. And in the Catholic Church, there were Catholics, there were Unitarians, and there were Universalists. 
that had taken over the North. Unit Universalists and Unitarians did not believe in the doctrine of the atonement of Christ, and his atonement saves us. The Unitarians, the Universalists said, uh, no Universalists. The Universalists said, no, that's, that's in a deplorable doctrine of blood atonement. Well, we believe in self-atonement. And we believe that through works you can self-atone for your sins. And so as you're studying church history, you're seeing, okay, the devil is getting in and the apostasy is coming and they're turning away from Christ. They're turning away from the blood. They're turning away from the message of Paul. And this ecumenical movement is to take every one of these people and put them all back under Rome because the Catholic Church and the Pope is the one pushing the ecumenical movement. And many denominations today have gone back into the Catholic Church, and they're meeting with the Pope. And so you've got to be careful, but the ones that stood up against that for many, well, I was going to read Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14, and Revelation 19, 20, but I won't. But it talks about the false prophet. When the Antichrist comes on the scene in the world, he's going to have a false prophet. So the Antichrist is going to have his one world church, and the Antichrist has a false prophet prophet and that false prophet does miracles so i believe the bible teaches in the last days there will be a one world church and all these denominations are going to get into that one church even the muslims and that's not what we should do now thankfully we leave at the rapture so we don't have to worry about it but after the rapture all these people that were in these denominations that were left behind because they weren't safe they'll say well we might as well join with the pope well, we all believe the same thing anyway. Really, we do. Because they don't believe in anything. See, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, is the old saying. So, where am I going next? Okay, where am I going with this? So, so you had the Baptists. And the Baptists were the main ones to stand against ecumenicalism. And they would call themselves fundamental. I'm a fundamental Baptist. They would pound the pulpit. I'm a fundamentalist. And, you know, I call them funny mentalists. But... At that time, they were still good. They still believed, you know, in the scriptures. They really were the last denomination that was really taking a stand for the scriptures. And about that time, there was a school in Texas called Baylor University. And Baylor University was supposed to be a Baptist school, but Baylor University, this would be about the 1920s, 1930s, Baylor University said, you know what? We're going to allow evolution to be taught in our school." And when that happened, many, many Baptists said, "We no, no, we do not believe in evolution. Why? Why are you apostatizing? apostatizing? And there was a guy named J. Frank Norris. Now, I'm going to tell you right now the history of where the independent Baptists come from. And many people believe that J. That J. Frank Norris was the man who started the independent Baptist movement. And that's what's so funny. It's really not a denomination because it's independent. Every independent Baptist church is an independent church. So they're really not a denomination because they're supposed to be independent. <laughs> but they call themselves the Independent Baptist Denomination. And many call themselves an Independent Fundamental Baptist, an IFB. Maybe you've heard of the IFB movement. That's what they call themselves. I'm an Independent Fundamental Baptist. All right, so there was a man named J. Frank Norris who lived in the 30s, 40s, I don't know, something like that. And he was a big name Independent Baptist. Or actually, no, sorry. He was a Southern Baptist. And he had a church down in Texas somewhere. I forget what city he was in. I don't think it was Austin. I forget. And he was down in Texas. And the weird thing about him, he also had a church up in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. And he had an assistant pastor in Detroit, Michigan named Beecham Vick. And so Beecham Vick was his assistant pastor in Michigan. While he pastored down in Texas, this J. Frank Norris. But he would travel back and forth. And two weeks, he'd stay up in Michigan and preach. Then he'd say, no, Bertram, you got it. I'm going back down. And he'd preach down there for two weeks in, um, in, uh, in Texas. Now, this guy, this guy, Jake Frank Norris, was a real man. And all through church history, you find real men. And you see false men. Real men are men that will dogmatically stand for the truth. And they're willing to die for the truth. And they will not compromise whatsoever. And you know, Martin Luther was one of those. You know, he should have left the Catholic Church, but he didn't. But he was willing to stand and not compromise. Hey, justification by faith, that's it. And this church has got it wrong. I'm standing on this. So I always respect a real man who's willing to stand. So this J. Frank Norris guy, he had a famous uh, big-name radio station 
down in Texas, and it really went all over America. And every, what was it, Saturday or Friday, or I don't forget what day it was, but everybody would tune in to hear J. Frank Norris preach the gospel. And uh, J. Frank Norris, when he heard that Baylor University was now going to teach in their Bible school evolution, he said, that's it. I can't be Southern Baptist anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with that. And so he was the first that is credited as saying, I am now an independent Baptist. I'm no longer Southern Baptist. I am pulling out of the Southern Baptist Convention because now they're allowing evolution to be taught. Now, J. Frank Norris was an interesting fella. He was, he was something else. He was very um, dogmatic in what he preached, but he was a real man. J. Frank Norris one time, there was a guy that preached against J. Frank Norris and said, Just, he's the devil, he's this, he's that, J. Frank Norris. You're, and, and J. Frank Norris didn't do anything. This guy was evil. And that evil guy was in a train wreck, and a train went over his car and killed this guy. J. Frank Norris found out that his enemy, the guy that was against him, died. He went out and found the scene where the train wreck was, and he found part of the man's brains laying there on the train track. He got a mason jar, he scooped up the brains of the mason jar, and on Sunday morning, he put it on the pulpit. He said, brothers and sisters, you know this fella, such and such, he used to preach against us, that devil, that liar, that deceiver. You know what the Bible says? It says, you better watch out, because if you're against God, God will judge you. He says, I want to show you the judgment of God today. Here are the brains of that man. <laughs> I was like, whoa, you know, who does that today? But he did it. He did. I mean, he, he was somebody that he, he wouldn't back down. And so J. Frank Norris, he had a radio station. And what he would do is now that he saw they're allowing these evolutionists to come in and, and these German rationalists, these skeptics, he would say, well, I've got an hour long radio station. Why don't you come on my radio station, Mr. Skeptic, Mr. Professor of a secular college, Mr. I believe in evolution. And I'll get and we'll debate. And so he would ha have these nationwide debates on the radio, J. Frank Norris. Fort Worth, Texas, First Baptist Church. That's the one. So it was in Fort Worth, Texas, close to Dallas. And so he would have this debate, and he would say, okay, you've got the first 30 minutes, and you can say whatever you want. And he'd let these liberal, lost professors get up for 30 minutes and talk about, well, oh, we believe in evolution, and we believe that science is proving that we came from monkeys. And for 30 minutes, they say whatever they want. And he got them on saying, I'm going to debate you. But when they were done, he would come on and go, okay, now I've got 30 minutes to preach the gospel, so forget whatever that guy said. I wasn't even listening because it's such a load of garbage. Now the Bible says, and he just preached for 30 minutes. Didn't debate them, didn't get, didn't say anything. <laughs> he just preached. And uh, he did that over and over. And, and so many Christians loved J. Frank Norris, and they were just like, praise God. He, he gave them the time of day, but he's not going to debate them. He's, the reason he did that is because that person was still in the radio booth, and he was probably preaching right to them <laughs> the whole time. So J. Frank Norris was a pretty amazing fella. J. And J. Frank Norris, he wouldn't back down. There was a man in his, who was against J. Frank Norris, and he told J. Frank Norris, I'm going to kill you. He says, bring it on. And that man came into the, the church building and came into his office and, and said, J. Frank Norris, I'm going to kill you. And he pulled his gun out, and J. Frank Norris pulled his gun out from his desk and went, bow, and just shot him dead. Called the cops. The cops sent him in and said, yep, justified, and you just defended yourself. All right, we'll get this dead body out of here right now, Mr. Morris. Uh, Norris. And so J. Frank Norris was a man, and he preached so hard. He made enemies, but he preached the truth, from what I understand. And and Beecham Vick was his his uh, assistant. I've met Beecham Vick's uh, grandson. I uh, spent time to him in his house. So it's interesting that I got in just enough to, to know some of these people that would have been my grandfather's generation, that would have been the last really good, strong Christians before we really see a lot of people going into apostasy. So J. Frank Norris, he pulled out of the Southern Baptist Convention and said, we can't do this. And a lot of other Southern Baptists followed suit and said, you know what, we're going to call ourselves Independent Baptists. And so 50s, 60s, 70s, the last real good denomination in America of true Bible believers that stuck by the book and followed the Bible were these people that were called independent Baptists. Even into the 80s, and maybe some in the 90s, but a lot of independent Baptists now, many don't even use the King James, unfortunately. Uh, many are turning against. Well, there was a guy, and, and let me write up here some names of people that you may or may not know. Uh, some famous people, a famous Baptist that preached pretty good that you may or may not know would have been Charles Spurgeon. 
Um, you, you don't know if you ever heard of Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a neat guy in England, and he was a good preacher, and he was a famous Baptist preacher. Had a really awesome beard. Um, when I grew my beard out a little bit more, uh, people said, you look just like Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that was his name, C.H. Uh, Spurgeon. And uh, hey, you look just like Spurgeon. And uh, oh, thanks. I guess I'll have to shave a little bit. I don't want to look like that guy. Um, during the Civil War in America, there was a famous preacher named D.L. Moody. All right. These are all people that would have been in the line of the, of the true Christians. Uh, there was a famous preacher named Billy Sunday, and Billy Sunday had national revivals all over America, although I don't really like Billy Sunday personally because Billy Sunday preached more against alcohol than he did the gospel, which is fine. There was a lot of people that were drunk, and you know he saw people get saved, but you should preach the gospel, okay? That's the most important thing, but he was more of a preacher against certain things than he was the gospel, but Billy Sunday uh, was a famous man. Then you have Norris. Uh, you would have had uh, over here, in the 60s, you would have people like J.R. Rice, John R. Rice, famous independent Baptist preacher, Lester Roloff. Oh, man. Lester Roloff was a was an evangelist that traveled and preached. And Roloff was an amazing man. He had a, a girl's home, I believe. And if you want a blessing, go to YouTube and look up Lester Roloff singing and listen to the way he sung just wonderful spiritual hymns and things like that. Uh, there was a famous preacher named Bob Jones. And I don't know much about Bob Jones. He was a peanut farmer. There was a Sam Jones, old Sam Jones. That was a good preacher. So in the 1800s, early 1900s, there were still good preachers that were sticking with the stuff and teaching. And they were Baptists. Now, there might have been some other good ones, uh, like Clarence Larkin. Uh, Clarence Larkin wasn't a Baptist. I forget what Larkin was. I think he might have been a Presbyterian. And he had some good Bible teaching. So there were still some good ones that hadn't gone apostate that would have been Protestant. But oftentimes they, they would come over to the Baptists because they saw, well, the Baptists are the ones that are sticking closest to the Bible. And so you had these guys. Well, then this guy came along who I despise, to be honest with you, named Billy Graham. And a lot of people today will say, Billy Graham, why well, he was the greatest evangelist in our day, that Baptist Billy Graham. And he was a Southern Baptist till the day he died. But I, early Billy Graham, when you see him in black and white, he does say first Corinthians 15 doesn't really mention the blood much but he does preach the gospel but something's wrong with billy graham i know he died at 90 something years old not too long ago but at the end of his life billy graham said crazy things like all muslims are in the body of christ and you're like what he said there's no hell hell is just separation from god it's not literal fire what i mean what happened to him did he become a german rationalist or something and a lot of people think that Billy Graham is this great evangelist, and I, I see just an apostate preacher in that guy. But Billy Graham was a big name. And so as you're looking at all of church history, you're finding that in the last days, the, the last, I hate to even say it like this, but the last decent denomination within Christianity were the Baptists. And then even the Southern Baptists went into apostasy, so you had the Independent Baptists. And the Independent Baptists were, were beginning to be the best ones. So then comes a along a guy named Peter S. Ruckman. And people have asked me, Brother Breaker, who is Peter S. Ruckman? Why do you keep mentioning Peter S. Ruckman? Well, here is Peter Ruckman. This is this is Peter S. Ruckman. And, uh, well, I, I already showed it. This is a, a book by Gene Kim. <laughs> Gene Kim went to Buck Ruckman's Bible School. I went to Ruckman's Bible School as well. And I'll tell you a little bit about Ruckman and why Ruckman. Uh, this is the, the class, all the people that, that went to Ruckman's in their class photo. And here's when I graduated. I'm just going to show you this for fun. But uh, it's kind of funny. There's some guy on YouTube that says, Robert Breaker never graduated from Ruckman's Bible School. It's like, okay, there's the alumni. And here's my name, Robert Breaker. And <laughs> it's like, people just lie. And that ugly fellow right there would be me. Oh, that ugly fellow, man, without the beard. At least he was skinnier then. So I did go to Peter Ruckman's Bible school. Now, people ask me all the time, who is Peter Ruckman? Well, Peter Ruckman was something else. I can just give you stories all night about this guy, Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman came from a long family of, of military men. And so Peter Ruckman was raised as a man. and He was a military man. Matter of fact, he was in World War II. He was didn't fight in combat, I don't believe, but he was a uh, drill instructor in World War II. Ruckman went to Bob Jones University, and Ruckman went to this school in order to learn to be a preacher, and, and Ruckman would do chalk talks, and a chalk talk, he was a great artist, Ruckman, and he would get out, and he'd have 
and well, they didn't have whiteboards back then, but they had this big, huge board, and he would put a long piece of white paper on it, and he would paint a picture while he preached to people on the street corner. And so Ruckman was a very good artist. You can still go to YouTube today and look up the, the Ruckman's chalk talks and things like that. But, but who is Peter Ruckman? Well, <clears throat> Peter Ruckman was studying church history, and he was born in 1921, same time as my grandmother, uh, a couple months apart. And it's, it's weird. They both died a couple months apart. And uh, Ruckman was, was born in 1921, if I believe, if I remember correctly. And Ruckman was a, a man who just lived like the devil till he was 21 or 27 years old. And then he got saved. And he went through a lot of stuff. He had a very high uh, IQ, this Peter Ruckman fella. Very smart. And he went to Bob Jones University. And he didn't know much, except that he got saved. And, you know, even his testimony, he gives his testimony two, three different ways sometimes. So it's hard to know which one was the way that he really did get saved. But that, that's not important. It's just, he got saved, and he was here in Pensacola, Florida. And before he got saved, he was working downtown at the old uh, Masonic building on W-E-R-E, W-E-A-R-T-V, which is what it is now, W-E-A-R-T-V. But back then it was W-E-A-R um, radio station. And so Ruckman was a guy that worked on the radio. And old Ruckman was on the radio, and a guy came in, told him, you know, the gospel and everything. Uh, U Pile, I believe, was his name. Pastor at one time over in Panama City and here in Pensacola, the old Brent Baptist Church. And Ruckman was a character, man. Ruckman had studied so much. Ruckman had a pretty high IQ, and he was trying to just find something. And finally, he found Jesus, and thank God for that. And he uh, was, was left the radio station and began to, to pray about what to do and everything. And I don't want to get too much into Ruckman. I don't want to praise the man. I mean, I knew him. My father knew him. I could tell you so much about Ruckman. Uh, sat in his church for many years. But I'm not going to praise the man. He's not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But the man was an, an incredible dude because of the things that he did. And Ruckman believed in the King James Bible. He had tried everything. He'd done everything. And he says nothing else but the King James now, one of the things that people remember Peter Ruckman for is the King James Bible. Because here's the thing, and I've got to tell you this, okay? These German rationalists had done their job and got people to doubt whether the King James Bible was really God's word. And in 1884, they printed the revised version of the Bible. And a lot of guys, even Tory, even Larkin, they started to say, you know, I guess I'll start using the revised version because other people are using the revised version. They didn't see the errors and the mistakes in these new versions of the Bible. They were being duped. They were being deceived by these false Christians into thinking that the King James isn't any good, and so they started using other versions. So Bob Jones University, they used the King James, but in their classroom, they preached against the King James. And they said, well, we got these other manuscripts, and they're better. The King James is not good. And so Peter Ruckman, when he came on the scene as a preacher, many of these men of God that were preachers, they would preach from the King James, but they didn't believe it because they were taught in Bible school and it's, it's got errors and mistakes. So you can preach from it, but if you wait long enough, while there be a better Bible, while the NSRV or the RNRSV or the, and, and all these new versions that came out, they keep saying this will be the better Bible. And so they started to say, you know, a better rendering in the, would be, or the King James Bible says this, but that's not right. And Peter Ruckman says, no, no, the King James Bible is right. It comes from the right text. And he studied that. And he says, these guys are wrong. And so Peter Ruckman is best remembered today as the man that stood for the King James Bible amidst the time and when many people were turning against it. And he says, I will not turn from that book. Now, here's the cool thing about Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman goes down there to Bob Jones University in South Carolina. And he's, he's a newbie. You know, he's 27, 28 years old, hadn't been saved long. And he's sitting there in their Bible school. And he's listening to these teachers in that Bob Jones University say, the King James Bible is errors and mistakes. And it's a horrible translation. Oh, this horrible King James Bible. And he raises his hand. He goes, Professor, why on earth are you saying that? He said, I got saved from that Bible. And you're telling me that's not God's word? What kind of God can't preserve his word? And they say, Mr. Ruckman, shut your mouth. You're not the Bible teacher here. <laughs> and so Ruckman just couldn't take it. And he tried to quit several times. And he kept getting letters in the mailbox from Bob Jones University saying, Mr. Ruckman, keep coming. Keep listening. Keeps, we, I think there's some potential. Uh, to this day, people recognize Peter Ruckman as probably one of the most highest IQ people. And, and also a man who has written, I think he's written over 150-something books. I mean, that's incredible. Who's written that many books? 
And um, but also uh, Ruckman was um, uh, very intelligent. And what was the where was it going with that? I was about to. Well, let me just read you from this book what um, what Bob Jones said about Ruckman. Here's a. Well, okay. Well, here's John R. Rice. John R. Rice says about Ruckman, for the record, had it not been for the president, our press, press, prescient and unique ministry of Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, the current remnant of King James Bible believing independent Baptists would never have divorced themselves from the misguided recommendations of well intended men and would now be probably using their standard version. Because so, G, so Jesus used Peter Ruckman in these last days to stand up against these so called Bible scholars and show them and expose them as liars and why the King James Bible is God's word. And many of these independent Baptists were beginning to turn against the King James Bible, but Peter Ruckman stood up against it and started to get people to go back to the King James Bible and question, yeah, are those guys right? Um, old Bob Jones says, yeah, I guess I can't find it. I thought I would have found that for you. Uh, somewhere in this book is a quote from Bob Jones where, Bob Jones himself says, Peter Ruckman is one of the smartest men I ever met. Probably the smartest men that ever came to this college. So Ruckman's sitting in his Bible uh, class one day and listening to these professors attack the King James Bible. And he's just sitting there. And Ruckman was just going to go to school there to graduate. He didn't want to take Hebrew and Greek. He just wanted to learn the Bible and then go out and be a preacher or something. He didn't, probably didn't even want to be a teacher. He just wanted to learn the Bible. And he said one day he's sitting in Bible school. And this preacher says, now, when Jesus says the parable of the rich man and, uh, and the poor man in hell, and Ruckman raised his hand. And, and, you know, when Ruckman raised his hand, everybody in class goes, oh, boy, not again. You know, because he kept raising his hand and going, no, no, what's what said. And he'd argue with the professors. And Ruckman goes, hold on a second. You said the parable of Luke 16? Ruckman said, that's not a parable. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the parable of Luke 16. That is literally a man that went to hell. And Jesus is telling a story of something that literally happened. And that professor said, Mr. Ruckman, do you know Hebrew and Greek? They said, no, no, I don't, know. I don't suppose I do. I just came to school here. He goes, when you learn Hebrew and Greek, you can, you can correct the professor. Until then, shut your mouth. I'm the teacher here, Mr. Ruckman. And Ruckman said he put his hand down, and the other students were like, hmm, hmm, you know, like, hot told you. Ruckman sat there, and he said, this man is lying to me, telling me that this is a parable when it's not a parable. Luke 16 is literally a, a rich man went to hell, and that's what he said. He said and Ruckman said to himself right there, I'm going to learn Hebrew, and I'm going to learn Greek, and I'm going to expose this low-down, sorry, liar for what he is for attacking my King James Bible. So Ruckman went to old man Jones and said, I want to sign up for Hebrew and Greek class. And so Ruckman took Hebrew, to, Ruckman took Greek. Ruckman had a, a Hebrew teacher named Brokenshire. And his Hebrew teacher, Mr. Brokenshire, they called him Old Brokey. All the students said, oh, Mr. Brokey. Brokenshire told Bob Jones, he says, Peter Ruckman is the smartest man I've ever met. He said, of all the people that have ever taken my class over the 10, 20, 30, however many years he was there, he says, this is the guy that got it. He can... He knows Hebrew backwards and forwards. Brokenshire died at his desk grading papers. And the last paper that he graded was Peter Ruckman's paper. And when he died, they found him dead at his desk, hunched over. And he had written a note. This man can teach this class. He knows this so well. That's just what a dead man said about Peter Ruckman. So Peter Ruckman learned Hebrew. He learned Greek. And when he got out of that college... He looked around, he says, all these people are lying to themselves and to others when they attack the King James Bible. And Ruckman made it his point in life to go show everyone why the King James Bible is the word of God. So that's one of the reasons today that we remember Peter Ruckman is he's such a, he, he stood for the King James Bible. And he is probably the number one man who stood for the King James more than anyone else. And I've got quotes here in this book from other Christians that say, if it hadn't been for Ruckman, we probably wouldn't be using the King James today. He stood for the King James Bible. Ruckman was also a Bible teacher. And uh, he started a, a Bible school, the Pensacola Bible Institute. And uh, yeah, he did a lot of things. Uh, to this day, though, if you believe in the King James Bible, people want to call you a Ruckmanite. 
I'm not a Ruckmanite. I just call myself a Bible believer. Yeah, I went to his Bible school. You know, I love the man for teaching the Bible and standing for the book. Um, do I agree with him 100%? No, maybe 90, 95%. He's sinner just like everybody else, but he stood for the truth and he had a great ministry, a great impact uh, for Christ. A lot of people learned the Bible from Peter Ruckman. And uh, a lot of people have, have learned why the King James Bible. So a lot of people ask me, Brother Breaker, why do you mention Peter Ruckman? Well, I went to his Bible school. And I'm very, I count myself very blessed to know all this history and to see all this and to see, you know, which would be the denomination that would be the closest to the Bible. Well, throughout history, it would be this top line. And in the last hundred years, those that would have stuck with the scripture, the one denomination that would have been closest to the Bible than all of them would have been the Baptists. And then the independent Baptists. And then one of the biggest independent Baptist people in the world was Peter Ruckman. And he stood for the King James Bible. That's why I believe in the King James Bible, because the King James Bible is God's word, not because Ruckman says so. You look at the text that it comes from, and those are the pure line of text that the Bible says to get the Bible from. And all these false scholars, they say, no, the right text are the Catholic texts. And it doesn't take a genius to see the reason they're preaching that the Catholic critical texts are the best is because they want everybody to come back in the ecumenical movement into their one world religion of Rome. So I appreciate Ruckman. I mean, he wasn't perfect. He was a, a very angry man, said a lot of mean things to people sometimes, and he was very quick to judge people, and he judged me poorly. He said things about me that weren't true. He allowed some people to lie to him about me, and I still have the letters that I got from Ruckman, several, two letters in which he says things that are just not true, and I just wrote him back and said, I don't understand why you would say this about me. I know who told you that, and I know that man lied about me. And uh, I love you anyway, Dr. Ruckman, whatever. You, you can believe whatever you want around me. That's fine. And so I don't have anything to do with Ruckman or his school or anything like that now. But I appreciate the man. Now, here's what that man did. I forgot to tell this story. This is one of the coolest stories. So Ruckman learned Hebrew. And he learned Greek. And he stayed those four years. And if I, I think he might have stayed even longer. But Ruckman was supposed to graduate. And they wouldn't let him graduate from that school, Rob Jones University. And so the old man, Bob Jones, says, what's going on here? Why, why aren't you letting Ruckman graduate? He's, he's done everything he's supposed to do. He's passed all the classes. Why aren't you allowing Ruckman to graduate? Well, in order to graduate, you have to write a thesis paper. So Ruckman wrote a thesis paper. And when he wrote that paper, all of the professors read that paper, and they were offended. And they said, I'm not going to give it a grade. I don't, I don't like it. They were so offended. I don't like what he wrote there. <laughs> What was his thesis paper about? Ruckman wrote his thesis on church history. And Ruckman said, throughout church history, there's been true believers in Christ that gave their lives to Christ, that shed their blood for Jesus, that went out and witnessed and told people of the gospel and stood up as men for the truth and were persecuted and died. And then there were these false Christians that sat in musty, danky rooms and called themselves scholars, and all they did was tell everybody, you're wrong, I'm right. <laughs> and he said, so you have a true line of Christians that were winning people to the Lord and living for Jesus, and you have these bunch of fuddy-duddy fakies that, that claim to be Christians, but they aren't doing anything for Jesus. They, they just sit in judgment of the Word of God all day and talk about how they don't believe the Bible's true. Who was that aimed at? his professors that were doing that. So when the professors read that thesis, they're like, I'm not going to grade this. I don't know. I don't want to give this. And they were offended. Here's a story that Ruckman told one time. He says, one time his Greek teacher invited Ruckman into his office. And he says, Ruckman, and he didn't even look at him. When Ruckman walked in, he says, sit down, Ruckman. And the Greek teacher was looking out the window. He says, Ruckman, he says, I've been teaching Greek at this school for 20, 30 years. I can give you the declension of the nominative, the dative, the, the, you know, I can tell you if it's first year active indicative each word. He says, Ruckman, I know Greek probably better than, than, than Peter, the apostle, in his day. He said, but Ruckman, I've never won a soul to Jesus Christ a day in my life. He says, all this has been for nothing. And he almost started to cry. And Ruckman looked at that and went, Whew. I don't want to be that guy. You know, Ruckman could have ended up as a scholar somewhere sitting in an office all day writing books. He said, I don't want to be that guy. Ruckman said, I want to be an evangelist. I want to be somebody that goes around preaching and teaching. I want to stand for the King James Bible. 
So uh, Ruckman was a pretty <laughs> wild guy. He stood against those people in his day, whoever they were, that were trying to attack the Bible. He says, no, there's one thing that I can have my faith in and never worry about, and that's book. this book. Don't you ever, ever tell me that this has mistakes and errors. Because if this is an error, then I've got nothing. Either God preserved his word like he said he did, or God's a liar. So which is it? Well, I believe it's the King James Bible. So Ruckman was a pretty neat guy. Uh, Ruckman even tells a story about how when Billy Graham came to Bob Jones University, and Billy Graham actually wanted Ruckman to work with him because Ruckman said, the only thing I ever wanted to be was an evangelist. And Billy Graham says, will you come be evangelist for me? And uh, Ruckman's like, I don't, whatever. I don't think, oh, thank God he didn't get together. He, I think he saw through old Billy. But Ruckman was a pretty neat guy. Now, here's the problem with Ruckman. People hate Peter Ruckman because he was married more than once. He was married once. His wife left. Nothing you can do when something like that happens. Um, state of Alabama divorced them. He says, I don't agree. And the state of Alabama says, who cares? Nowadays, you can get an irreconcilable, irreconcilable deference or whatever. So Ruckman married again, and then the same thing happened. He married a third time. So people say Ruckman shouldn't have been a pastor. And you know what? Yeah, he wasn't the greatest pastor. I'll, I'll give you that. He probably shouldn't have been a pastor. He was a Bible teacher. So that's what I remember Ruckman as, as a Bible teacher. I went to his office several times because he was the pastor of Bible Baptist Church. And I said, Ruckman, I, I need some advice. I need to talk to you. And he'd look at you and he'd go, <laughs> don't bother me. I'm too busy. Go talk to the other guy, the assistant pastor. So to me, a pastor is someone that's there for you, someone to talk with you, someone that can give you advice as you're struggling or going through. He was always too busy for that. It was just, go talk to him. Leave me alone. I'm too busy. So to me, Ruckman really wasn't a pastor. Ruckman was more of a Bible teacher. And Ruckman had a Bible school called the Pensacola Bible Institute. And I graduated from there because my dad went there. My dad didn't go to graduate. My dad just went to learn the Bible. And Ruckman taught the Bible verse by verse. And I think Ruckman was a great, great Bible teacher. And that's all I want to say about Ruckman. I, I, I don't praise the guy. I've, I've met a lot of people that they're Ruckmanites. They literally follow the man. And... Who cares what the Bible says? If he said something different, they'd follow him over the Bible. No, no. Ruckman taught us, don't ever follow me. And don't ever follow a denomination. Don't ever follow a group. Follow what God says. So I don't call myself a Ruckman. I call myself a Bible believer. Uh, when we were in Bible school, Ruckman says, you need to be yourself. Don't try to be me. And a lot of people I've known went to Ruckman school and they come out and they think, I'm going to be like Ruckman. Well, no, I'm just me. I'm not going to be him and pretend to be like him. And uh, Ruckman would attack people and name call and do things like that. And that I was never comfortable with that. I don't do that. So, But I do count myself privileged to have gone to his Bible school. And I do appreciate him saying, when the Bible says one thing, and a man or a denomination or a Bible school or a church says something else, you kick them as far as you can kick them, and you follow the Word of God. And that's what I do. Now, today, there are some Bible schools out there still. I think the Bob June University still exists, but I think, personally, it's apostate. I went there and visited it, and I wasn't very impressed. There's the Pensacola Christian College here in Pensacola, and supposedly that's pretty good. Um, there's Liberty University, which I don't think is that great anymore. There's still Bible colleges out there. Um, I don't even know the name of all of them. Northwestern, Midwestern, this, that, and the other thing, Bible Fellowship. So I don't know. But there's these independent Baptist fundamentalist uh, Bible colleges and here's what I'm seeing that's so sad within the Independent Baptist Church. People ask me, Brother Breaker, is the Independent Baptist denomination still good? Well, there still are some good ones out there. But there are a lot of them that have already started to go into apostasy. And uh, people ask me, you know, and, well, first of all, I go to an Independent Baptist Church. I found one that is a good one. I, I thank God for it. And we go there for fellowship and hear preaching. But there's a lot of them that are going downhill because they've got all these different Bible colleges. And a lot of times a person will go to one of their Bible colleges and now they come out and they say, well, I'm of this group. And what I found as I went as a missionary, I would go preach in different churches and I'd be like, well, what Bible school did you go to? And I'd say, well, I went to, you know, Pensacola Bible. Oh, you're one of those people. Well, had you gone to this one where I went, well, I would fellowship. And what I saw was that many of these independent Baptists are what I call groupies. They're a bunch of groupies 
And unless you're part of their group, why, you can't fellowship with that. And that's political. That's disgusting. And I never got involved with that, and I never will. I'm not going to butter up to some guy just to get in his pulpit and preach and say, yeah, we're from the same school. You and I, we're the same. No, I'm going to serve God, and I don't care what these other guys do. That's their business. Let them do whatever they want. And I, I would go to churches, and I'd preach, and the pastor would ask me, Brother Breaker, what camp are you in? And that's how they talk. What camp are you in in the independent fundamental Baptist church? Why, are you a pcc -er? Are you a, a, a Ruckmanite? Uh, are you a, 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 a Bob Jones? Why, are you a Bible Baptist fellowship? I mean, what, what camp are you in? They always want to know, what camp are you in? You know what I'd tell them? I'd say, Pastor, I'm without the camp with Jesus. How about you? <laughs> Whew, I didn't make too many friends as I went around. I've preached in about 200 different independent Baptist churches. Probably about 10 Southern Baptist churches in my lifetime. I've gone around and preached in these different churches. And I see that within the independent Baptist movement, there's a lot of groupies, a lot of groupism, a lot of division. Because unless you're part of their Bible school or this or that or the other. So people ask me all the time, Brother Breaker, what denomination are you? Well, I was ordained as an independent Baptist. I was ordained by my church in Monterey, Mexico. And I've got the ordination papers there. I was ordained an independent Baptist. People say, well, how come you don't go around and brag about being an independent Baptist? Well, let me tell you why. Because just like every other denomination, they're heading downhill into apostasy. And I don't want to go along with them. So I don't brag on what denomination I came from. I say I'm a King James Bible believer. So people say, what denomination are you? I'm a King James Bible believer. To me, that's the most important thing. It's not about where you come from. Or what group you're with, it's about what do you believe? Do you believe that this is God's word? Do you believe that salvation is through faith in the blood of Christ? And that's what it's all about. A lot of people ask me, you know, Brother Breaker, if, you know, what do I do? I, I want a church to go to. And I think you should go to church. It's wonderful if you can find one. And people ask me, where can I find a church? Well, I tell people go to fundamental.org. Fundamental.org is a website that supposedly has a list of King James Bible-believing churches all over the, the entire world. And look there and see. But then you got to go to that church and find out if they really are. But it's great if you can find a good church. But it's very hard to find God in one of these cults. It's very hard to find the Lord in, in these denominations because they're not even King James anymore. Uh, I love Southern Baptists. Some of my best friends... When I was growing up, we're Southern Baptists. We'd go to Southern Baptists, but they don't use King James. Most Southern Baptist churches don't preach faith in the blood of Christ. They preach one, two, three, repeat after me, or, you know, say this prayer and, you know, uh, shake the preacher's hand and walk the aisle. And I'm seeing that most denominations are apostate. And I find that very sad, very sad. So... That's it. People have asked me, what denomination are you? Well, I'm an ordained, independent, fundamental Baptist preacher. But I don't like to say that because of so many of those going headlong into apostasy. It's scary what's going on now in the name of independent Baptists. I mean, just go to YouTube, look up independent, fundamental Baptists, and look at some of the preachers that show up. Some of them are adulterers and in jail for, for raping 14-year-old girls. Uh, some of them are Ugh, just wanting to kill people and, and preaching so hard against a certain group that, oh, they ought to die. Well, I believe they ought to be killed and things like that. And there's a lot of critical spirit and things like that. Here's what I want to say before I close. You don't have to be a part of a group for God to use you. Let me say that directly to the camera. As I read my Bible, here's what I see over and over and over a recurring theme. The recurring theme of the Bible it's one man and God. God isn't always working with the group. Usually when the group gets together, the first thing they do is kick God out. We see that in the, uh, the, the Tower of Babel. They all came together and said, you know what? Let's just build a tower and just go up and kick God out of heaven. <laughs> so a lot of times people get together and they say their strength in numbers. And then when they get enough numbers, why they put their faith in their numbers rather than in God. But when you're out on your own by yourself, you have to trust in God more than these groups do. And I see over and over and over this recurring theme. God looks down from heaven and he sees apostasy. And he says, if there's just one man 
that I could use. Found Noah one time. Another time he looked down and says, Enoch, Enoch, come on. All throughout the Old Testament, you see a prophet here or there. God calls him out says, go preach to those people. Tell them the truth because they sure don't want it. So one man in God is the majority. So I want to be that one man that God uses. Now, I'm not against the independent Baptists. I'm not against, you know, that. I have friends that are independent Baptists. I, I go to an independent Baptist church. But I don't put my faith in the independent Baptist movement. I don't put faith in my denomination. I put faith in God and in the King James Bible. And I say exactly what Peter Ruckman said to me. If the independent Baptists say one thing and the Bible says another, you kick them out and you follow the Bible. And that's what it's all about. That right there. King James Bible. That's my authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now, when I talk like that, here's what I get from independent Baptists. Well, then you're not accountable to anybody, are you, Robert Breaker? Well, you're just a rebel out on your own. You're not accountable to anybody, are you? <laughs> I'm accountable to God. I'll give account to him one day. I'm accountable to the churches that support me. I have some churches that support me, and I send them a letter every couple of months and tell them what the Lord's doing in our ministry. I'm accountable to the people that help us and support us. Um, what do you mean I'm not accountable? I have a home church in Mexico that's my supporting and sending church. And our pastor there loves us and takes care of us and hopefully get to go this year with him down to Peru and preach down there. I, I, no, no. People want you to be a part of a group so that they can lord over you and say, you know, you got to do what we do. I don't see that. I see what I'm doing is the right thing. Winning people to the Lord, preaching. And all the time, people will contact me and say, Brother Barker, I'd really like to go to a church. Where is one? I say, well, go to fundamental.org and try to find a good King James Bible believing independent Baptist. They're out there somewhere. Maybe you'll find one. I hope you do. But be careful. So there you go. I don't know what else to say. I mean, there it is. People ask me, what denomination is the right one, Robert Breaker? Well, it sure ain't that one. The Roman Catholic Church ain't it. And all the little minions that came out of her, they ain't it either. None of them use the King James Bible anymore. And now they're going back to Rome and they don't even use, they don't even preach the gospel. The true church, why, throughout history they stuck with the stuff, they stuck with the Bible, they stuck with the gospel of salvation. And they're around, but we must be in the last days before the rapture because that's the last denomination. And even it's going downhill into apostasy. People say, Brother Breaker, I want to go to Bible school. Where should I go? And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. Can I go to the Bible school you went to? Okay, help yourself if you want to. Just sit in the back and keep your mouth shut. That's what I would recommend. My dad told me when I went to Pensacola Bible Institute, he said, son, sit in the back. Keep your mouth shut. And when you get done, get out of there. He said, there's things going on there that you don't know. And, and those people, it's just like they're looking for something to, to judge you and, and, and speak bad about you and say things. And well, I didn't listen to my dad. I learned the hard way. And sure enough, I saw some things. Um, I had some friends that went there not too long ago and just graduated. And they told me they say bad things about me at that school. And I'm like, why? All I'm doing is preaching what the Bible says and doing what Ruckman told me. <laughs> How can you be against me? I, oh, whatever. And I guess they've made themselves a little lie about me. And they say, you know, this, that, and the other thing about Robert Breaker. And it's okay, whatever. So people ask me, but Brother Breaker, I want to learn the Bible. Well, it's one of the best schools. If you go there, just don't tell them you know Robert Breaker. Because they'll kick you out, probably. Because they don't like me. You know what? I don't live for the approval of man. I live for the approval of the Lord. And everything I do, I do to please Him. And I'd love to be friends with them. I'd love to fellowship with them. Um, if they don't want fellowship with me, that's that's on them. Amen. I mean, you can choose who you fellowship with. And if you don't like somebody, you don't like somebody. But I want to say publicly, I appreciate Dr. Peter S. Ruffin for his stand for the book and for his stand on teaching young men the Bible so they can go out and preach. And I'm going to leave it at that. And I appreciate you know all he's done for me. And I'm, I'm glad that I got to go there and learn the Bible. And I want to continue teaching and preaching the word of God. So I'm going to close it there. I'm not going to even do any questions. Um, people ask me, you know, get together with Gene Kim. If he wants to someday, that'd be great. I'd love to inter interview him and have him on. I'm not going to talk about Ruckman. I will just talk about God and the Bible and things we have in, in common. 
I really don't even want to talk about Ruckman anymore. But people have asked, well, who is Ruckman? Well, hopefully you get an understanding of who Ruckman is, why I bring him up sometimes. And hopefully you'll understand, you know, why this is one of the better denominations or was. And now it's how it's starting to go downhill. And uh, I contacted Gene Kim one time because someone in, emailed me and said, uh, Brother Breaker, I got saved watching your video and Gene Kim's video. I said, well, amen. So I wrote Gene Kim a little, you know, email said, I thought this might be encouraging to you. Somebody got saved watching my video and yours. So I'll pass that along. Maybe you can, you know, be blessed by it. Never heard anything back. So, amen. So appreciate him. Uh, a lot of people say Gene Kim has some really good videos and that's great. He did go there as well to the ben Pensacola Bible Institute. And uh, he's here in this book. Yeah, 2007, he would have graduated from there. Eh, I don't think I'll show you a picture. You might not might not want me to do that, but he's here in this picture. There he is. So, again, to me, it's not about Ruckman. It's about the Bible. It's about the gospel. It's about the scripture. It's about the truth. But from time to time, people bring up Ruckman. Why Ruckman? Why Ruckman? And a lot of people still to this day attack Ruckman because he's been married more than once. And that's, I don't see a need to bring him up. I'm just teaching you what the Bible says. A lot of people say, no, Breaker, you preach what Ruckman says. No, Ruckman told me, don't preach what he said. Always preach what the Bible says. So that's what I want to do. So there it is. I hope that is a blessing to you. Uh, thank you for watching. Let me get out of the way if you want to take a screenshot. I have thoroughly enjoyed this, trying to explain all the different denominations. And the question was, why are there so many different denominations? Well, because so many people start their own little cult. And it's because they try to teach what they want the Bible to teach rather than what it actually does teach. And in order to not be a cult, you need to stick with Paul and Paul's gospel and be willing to take a stand for what you believe in. These people, many of them died because they would not compromise and join the false church. And that church killed them. And many of these people up here, they've stood for years for the truth and wouldn't back off from it. And I think that's amazing. So there it is. Thank you for watching. I'll call it quits there. And hopefully that answers your questions. God bless you. Thank you so much. We'll see you maybe next Thursday. Maybe not. I want to take a little more time with my wife. But uh, if, if I'm next Thursday here, we'll see you. If not, well, God bless. Thank you again. Bye-bye.